Well, good morning, Norwest. Uh, welcome to our daily devotions in the book of Acts. Uh, today we're in Acts chapter 4, uh, verses 32 to 37. Uh, we're going to be thinking about what fuels us as God's people. What fuels us as God's people. So uh, let me pray and uh, then we're just going to dive in and wrestle with some ideas together. Let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that your mercies are new every day, every single day. And we cling to that, particularly at this time. Um, but we also know that you are the good giver of every good gift. And we pray that you would uh, help us be fueled by your son, Jesus, his work, his power, uh, and trust that uh, you have given us everything we need for today. Uh, so... Uh, Help us wrestle well with your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are in the book of Acts today, and I'm just going to flick there. Uh, but I thought it might be helpful to give a bit of a recap, because it feels like a Hollywood blockbuster as we look through the first four chapters of Acts. There's 28 chapters. But in these first four, uh, there's been promise and fulfillment of uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. We've seen God's Holy Spirit come with power and people preaching and being incredibly bold like Peter. We see thousands upon thousands of people being shifted and changed and saved to the power and the name of Jesus. Healings that happen that point back to God's power at hand. Uh, and there's opposition that is absolutely remarkable. And yet the gospel continues to be shared. And there's a deep sense in God's people being prayerful and being incredibly thankful. And that's where we are up to today. We see that uh, Peter and John have just gone to the Sanhedrin. Uh, they've proclaimed Jesus powerfully in amongst opposition. They've uh, been taken out of arrest and they're really thankful. And then we zoom in on, uh, on sort of the, the, the tone of God's people. And so we're just going to read, we'll do some thinking, and I'm going to pray. Uh, I hope this is, blesses you as we open God's Word together. Uh, we're in Ephesians, uh, sorry, Ephesians, Acts, chapter 4, verses 32. All the believers were one and in heart and in mind. No one claimed that any of their possession was their own, but they shared everything that they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no one needy among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them. And they brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and bought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This... Three really remarkable things that uh, have really struck me and I hope to share them with you. And uh, I, I guess the first thing is, uh, is wrestling with the verse which says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. It's amazing to see this unity amongst the early church. That they were one in heart and mind, but they also voluntarily shared their possessions. That means they sold things they owned willingly in order that none would go without. Uh, it's remarkable as I look at this. They were so compelled and convinced of Jesus and his church that they would do it. It wasn't about looking at... Uh, the other, as it says, no one claimed that any of the possessions was their own. It wasn't saying, I have more than you, and no, I can't do that. Which really goes up against our culture, and also against the way I was raised. But it's more for the other. That's remarkable. I mean, it, I get really excited by seeing this, as well as uh, there's another episode of this in Acts 2, 42 to 47, I think, because you see the older church, sort of, the young, sorry, the, the first church gathering together. Um, but it as much as I get excited, it just feels a little bit out of reach. Uh, maybe at this time with COVID, but I, but I also know my own heart at times isn't, isn't willing to be at one heart and one mind at times with our good Lord, but also with God's people. 
um, and we need his spirit. Um, earlier this week, I was reading the Tower of Babel, uh, and I was thinking about the brokenness of how God's people or people decide to be like God and build this tower. And uh, I was reflecting um, on uh, on the brokenness of the fall in Genesis three. Uh, but also Cain and Abel and this fractured relationship with each other. And so as I look at this being uh, people in one heart and one mind with each other, it's truly remarkable. But I guess my bigger question, and the question that we have today is, just as much as coffee fuels me in the morning, what is fueling God's people to behave this way, to think this way, to do things this way? And it really comes in the next verse, in chapter uh, verse 33. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. So Jesus' death was incredibly significant. But his resurrection just changed everything. It was so good that they couldn't help but talk about it. I mean, just in the same chapter earlier on, Peter and, uh, and John at the Sanhedrin, they say this, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. For us, we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. And earlier on in verse 12 in chapter 4, Peter has this boldness and says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Jesus changes everything. His resurrection is the driver, the fuel for why they behave this way as God's people. You know, I I can't help but talk about a whole range of things, whether it's the frustrations of COVID or me feeling trapped at times, or the latest next Netflix show, or the cute things my kids have been doing, Zali Matea, I speak about a lot of things, a lot of things that are good, but perhaps that don't have eternal significance. I wonder what is fueling your thinking at this time. I wonder what is fueling your and stirring your heart to make it do certain things with actions. This is not to be condemning. This is just helpful just to wrestle with and think about, even at a time like this, um, as we live as God's people, because we want to be fueled by him to have one heart, one mind, to be with him in spirit and truth. Um, but it seems like, remarkably, the early church was stirred to preach Jesus despite being socially isolated in prison or despite embarrassment or humiliation, despite everything else, because they couldn't help speaking about the one who sustains them and gives them life, the resurrected Lord Jesus. Well, in in verses 34 to 37, we see another community, the same community rather, who just seem to share this generosity. This generosity of being united with each other and the Lord. And so they keep on sharing with each other to show that there is no one in need. And so Barnabas is picked out alongside a a bunch of others that continue to share their their properties, uh, lay the monies at the disciples' feet, the apostles' feet for distribution so that no one would go out without being united in one heart and one mind which is juxtaposed by the next passage uh, which uh, we'll find out more on Monday but I guess I want to keep on asking this question just as much as coffee fuels me in the morning uh, what fuels a people to be generous what shifts in their, their minds and and stirs their heart to give and to do things And that comes back to Jesus. It comes back to the resurrection, Jesus. Because Jesus is the only one that moves them from doubt to delight, from uh, from thinking about self to being self-sacrificial, from uh, people being caught up in their worries to lead into worship, from people being in fear to driving into faith. It seems like the thing that fuels God's people is Jesus. The thing that they can't help thinking about. The the one who their heart is so stirred for. uh, The way in which their hearts have been driven to be generous. It is Jesus. They're so marked by Jesus that they long to be self-sacrificial and generous with each other. To reflect what our great God is like. 
I wonder what's going on for you at this time as you've been fueled by all kinds of things. And I pray, I really do pray that God would search our hearts and see what is really driving us. And it will be the Lord Jesus. That our hearts, our minds and our hands will be stirred for good work to reflect his generosity as we are united in one mind and one heart with each other and the Lord. Let me pray um, for us. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks for our time together that we can sit under your word, um, but also that you long that none should not know you, that you long that all should come to the saving knowledge of your son, Jesus. And so, uh, Father, we want to pray uh, for our people at Norwest uh, and beyond, that they would treasure your son, Jesus, that they would uh, long to delight in the generosity that you have shown us, to reflect on how your resurrection of your son just changes everything, and that we too can be in one mind and heart with each other, because you have given us your spirit and you have given us your son. You've given us everything that we need. And so, Father, we want to pray in line of Psalm 139 as we finish our time together. And so we pray, Lord, would you search us? God, would you know our anxious heart? Would you test us and know our anxious ways and our anxious thoughts? And see if there's any offensive way in us and lead us in the way of everlasting and God's people said, Amen. Well, thanks for joining us this morning uh, in our devotional series in Acts. Uh, we hope to see more of you um, in the coming weeks as we continue our series. Hope you have a great day and uh, be fueled uh, by the Lord Jesus.